17 Ben Bynod lecture. Um, let me start by thanking Gabby Ritchie, who's been working full time on this program. But as you know, this is the start of the kickoff of our alumni reunion weekend. Um, so we're very pleased that Professor Angie traveled from Singapore to join us. I want to welcome the daughter of Professor Bynod, Helen Bynod, and her husband. Alex Corran. I think you just came in from the UK, or are you coming from the UK, so welcome. Um, Weber Wenzel, Giles White, Professor Giles White, when he's not at Weber Wenzel, thank you for your support and sponsoring of this annual lecture. Um, we have some esteemed members of the Western Cape High Court, Judge Ali, Judge Papier, and Judge Saldana, all proud alumni of UCT. We have Judge Lamini from the uh, Swaziland High Court, who used to be a, a student of Judge Davis. So as you know, tomorrow we're starting, the, uh, uh, day, we're starting a symposium at the beginning of the weekend, and some of uh, Judge Davis's friends are here. Uh, Carl Clare has joined us, Penny Green from the UK, uh, um, Leah Davis is here, a whole range of people. I can't mention all of you, so let me just say, all friends all observed. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me first tell you a little bit about Professor Bynod. Some of you were taught by him, some of you were colleagues. Um, so you, you know that this series was inaugurated in 2003 when I think you Corda was the dean, right? You were the dean at the time. Um, and it's dedicated to the memory of uh, uh, Professor Bynod, who's a legendary uh, uh, a member of, was a, a legendary member of this faculty and who held the W.P. Schreiner Professor of Law from 1950 to 1974. Um, Professor Dean, another former Dean, Professor Barry Dean, uh, has described Professor Baynard as uncompromisingly honest, acting always in accordance with the highest standards of propriety and integrity in both his personal and academic life, but always tolerant, ready to see both sides of any question, and to respect the views of others, even those with whom he disagreed. Uh, he's well remembered for his love of Roman Dutch law. Um, and Professor Engi joins a long line of distinguished speakers uh, to de deliver this uh, lecture. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, Professor Engi. It is a very small biography. If you Google him, you get about 10,000 hits. Um, he's a professor of law at the National University of Singapore. He's also on leave from the University of Utah, where he has been a law professor for 22 years. And he's been a visiting professor at several universities, including the American University of Cairo, Cornell, Harvard, the London School of Economics, and the University of Tokyo. Uh, his research interests include, amongst others, globalization, <coughs> development issues, and international law colonialism and the history of public international law, and third world approaches to international law. That's the twail that some of you may be wondering what it was about, whether it was a bird or something like that. But twail, third world approaches to international law. I remember the first conference, I think, at Contemporary Law School in 1998 or something like that. Harvard in 97. Harvard in 97. Harvard's always first in 97. And then since then, third world approaches to international law has been a feature of the critical legal landscape uh, in the United States. Um, in his book, Imperialism, Sovereignty, and the Making of International Law, uh, Professor Ang argues that the colonial confrontation was central to the formation of international law and its founding concept, sovereignty. I ask him, I tell him, whenever I introduce people, I like to say something personal about them, or maybe talk about the actor that will play them in the movie of their lives, and since Kevin Spacey was going to be the actor, <laughs> <laughs> now, I asked Professor Angie what I could say about him. He says he still regrets the 1999 Cricket World Cup when Australia beat South Africa. He thought South Africa should have won. <laughs> Um, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Penny, for that uh, very warm welcome. I think uh, 
it seems a problematic issue to designate, designate anyone as a potential actor to play one, because one just doesn't know how, how much further this whole process is going to continue. Uh, but uh, let me say it's wonderful to be here in Cape Town. This is my first visit here. Uh, and it's wonderful to see familiar faces, uh, Dennis, uh, uh, Penny, uh, a long-time friend, and um, after 22 years, Caswell, now uh, the Honorable Mr. Justice Fafia, who was a classmate of mine. Um, and it is also a great honor to be here for another more personal reason. Um, my teacher and mentor was uh, a person called uh, Christopher Wiramantri. Uh, he was the youngest judge of the Supreme Court of uh, Ceylon, as it was then. And he was later to become a judge of the International Court of Justice. And uh, his uh, renown in Roman Dutch law was such that uh, Stellenbosch University invited him to be a visiting professor at Stellenbosch. And this was during the period of apartheid. And uh, equally, uh, generously, uh, the administration offered to make him an honorary white uh, for the purposes <laughs> of this visit. Uh, professor Wiedemantri, I call him professor, uh, politely declined and accepted the invitation on the understanding that he would have complete freedom to teach as he wished uh, while he was at Stellenbosch. So he came here in the late 70s. He also uh, came here to the University of Cape Town and I believe also to the University of the Western Cape. Uh, so I feel very much, um, uh, I feel I'm yet again uh, following in his footsteps. And uh, later, uh, his South African colleagues were, uh, who he maintained contact with were very kind um, and um, uh, Professor Wiedemantri, after his stint at Stellenbosch, wrote a book called Apartheid, The Closing Phases. Uh, this was in the late 70s, perhaps 1980. Um, and uh, he maintained his contacts with his friends in South Africa. And um, I was the editor of a fest shift, uh that was compiled in uh, Professor's honor. And two of the contributors were from South Africa. Uh, Professor Walter DeVos, who I believe mm -hmm. was a teacher here. Uh, he uh, wrote a chapter on Roman Dutch law and the future of Roman Dutch law. Uh, and also Mr. Justice Pass Langer, uh, who wrote about uh, South Africa in the 21st century. And this was published in 1997. Uh, so for all these reasons, uh, it, it is wonderful for me to be able to visit Cape Town. And I feel particularly honored to be here on the occasion to deliver this lecture uh, in honor of uh, Professor Beinard. Uh, it is wonderful to meet uh, uh, Helen, his, uh, his daughter, and other members of the family. Uh, and by all accounts, he was a person of great integrity, of great generosity, um, and of great learning. Uh, I understand he knew his Latin perfectly, as one would have to, in order to be uh, a good, and if not brilliant, Roman Dutch lawyer. And he clearly had uh, inspired huge affection among everybody who knew him. Um, and it's also interesting for me to note, uh, just as an outsider, that uh, he uh, had an international reputation as well. He became professor of jurisprudence at Birmingham upon his retirement from this institution. And he must have great skills of leadership because I think he was appointed uh, dean a year after that. And so there is a great deal, I think, about his spirit that we can all benefit from. And um, uh, I feel very honored to be uh, in the position to uh, speak on this occasion, on the occasion of this lecture, which also maintains his spirit in various ways. Uh, so let me begin with uh, my topic. Um, yes, uh, when I was preparing in the rush to come here and I saw the topic I had in my haste provided, I suddenly thought, who would come to such a lecture? <laughs> I mean, what on earth would this mean? Twin. Uh, it sounds yeah, is it a bird? Uh, is it a whale? You know, is this endless, is Twain about endless complaining? Is that what it's really about? Um, well, uh, we should have thought more clearly about our branding before our movement called ourselves Third World Approaches to International Law, or Twail. But Twail it is, and Twail it is, uh, we continue uh, the tradition as being. So clearly, Professor Beinart is a person of great reputation because you're here despite the topic that I have chosen. Uh, but let me uh, actually now go to another aspect of Professor Beinart and his uh, work. So I thought I would begin with a quotation from his work. Uh, Every subject in my view should have an underlying theory and a critical approach, even procedure and evidence. And may I add for the purposes of this lecture, even, even international law. 
And so one of the interesting things is, what is the theory of international law that has governed our thinking about the discipline? So let me follow Professor Beinart in that regard, insisting upon the importance of an underlying theory. And another quotation from, from Professor Beinart, I'm not very good still with PowerPoint, hence the sort of uh, irregularity in terms of the, the wording. Uh, but here, this is Professor Beinart in the lecture he gave uh, upon his appointment to the Shriner Chair, where he says, historical study of the Roman sources must be a creative force. This calls for a class of lawyers aware of the past, as well as the means of the present. So here, he discusses history and the interesting question about how we should think of the past and how that past should actually provide us with resources to think of the present and of course beyond that to the future. So what I'm uh, hoping to do is to actually suggest ways in which theory and history might be connected and then how history and theory and decolonization might all be combined to suggest a different type of approach to international law, and that is the approach to international law, I call third world approaches to international law. So I feel like a juggler who has taken on a little too much, a little too many things sort of uh, wandering around, but let me try and uh, bring some order to the whole situation. Uh, in short, the argument I would like to make is that theory determines the way in which we see the world. Uh, it is uh, well known, uh, or perhaps something of a cliche even, uh, there's a cliche to the effect of something like, people who claim they don't have a theory are simply unaware of the theory, in fact, that they actually are utilizing. Theory, theory actually creates a community, because different people belong to different theoretical approaches, create communities among themselves. Theory suggests what the greatest problems a particular discipline must try to resolve should be. So that's another claim I would make about theory. Theory bestows status because the people who are seen as engaged in the most important theory and who seem to be most capable of solving the problems generated by the, that particular theory are the people who are most widely recognized in their particular profession as being the best scholars the cutting edge scholars who should win all the accolades and promotions and positions. Uh, theory often suggests a, a sort of project, a mission, a teleology. So in the case of international law, for example, the way in which we suggest the theory of international law suggests what the future of international law should be and what it is that scholars of international law, practitioners of international law should be working towards. And furthermore, theory uh, also suggests something like universality. It's very unusual for a theory to be modest in its scope. The greatest theories, the grandest theories, came to be universally valid, almost like the laws of science you know, in that respect. So theory performs all these different and complicated functions. So the question I would like to ask is, uh, what is the theory of international law, given what I've said about theory and the importance of theory, what is the theory of international law that governs the way in which we think about the discipline? That is the question I would like to ask, following Professor, Professor Beinart and his insistence on theory. And here we come to the issue of history. So my other claim is this. My other claim is that it is particular historical events which generate theory. It is when great thinkers focus on particular historical events that they try to find in those events something of greater and more universal significance. So uh, we might think of uh, Thucydides. Um, I know Professor Beinart was a brilliant scholar of Latin, I'm not sure about Greek, but Thucydides, uh, the great, uh, I can see a shake uh, <laughs> from uh, Helen there. Uh, uh, but uh, Thucydides, you know, studying the battle or the war between Athens and Sparta says, in Examining this war, I felt that if I studied this closely enough, I would come up with a set of principles that would, would be good for eternity. It would tell us something fundamental about societies, about states, about human nature itself. And of course, it's interesting that now that with the emergence of China, certain people, certain scholars, are saying this is a situation that Thucydides actually can provide us guidance about, because we can see this issue about 
another great power emerging and what sort of consequences will that have for the international community. Or Thomas Hobbes, you know, if we are talking about the great event that seems to have affected Thomas Hobbes, it would have been the Civil War, and he is thinking about what the relationship is between stability and law in those types of circumstances. So the event that I is traditionally seen by the classic history of international law as being decisive for the generation of the theory of international law is an event which it's a little blurred. Um, and perhaps uh, uh, if we didn't uh, have the, the lights on in quite the same way. But uh, let me just describe this picture. It is a, one of the great pictures of an uh, event called the Peace of Westphalia of 1648. So this was the peace that finally brought about uh, some kind of stability and order in a Europe that had been divided as a result of massive religious conflict, the Thirty Years' War, which was extraordinarily destructive. And the Peace of Westphalia, uh, embodied by two treaties, created a situation in which it is said the modern sovereign state came into existence, or the beginnings of the modern sovereign state. So international lawyers talk very often about Westphalian sovereignty as being the model of sovereignty that in many ways still is the model that our current international system embodies. Now the problem with this model is that in this system, all sovereign states are equal. So it is a model of horizontal order rather than vertical order. And so this gives rise to a classic problem that is seen as the classic problem of international law. Is international law really law? Because law is associated with a system in which there is a vertical system of authority. In other words, there is a sovereign that can legislate and can also enforce the law. And it is one of the classic criticisms of international law that there is no proper system of enforcement. And this is something that I encounter all the time, uh, you know, uh, from immigration officials when they ask me, well, what is it you do? And I say, well, I teach international law. And the immigration officer says, well, but that's not properly law, is it? And after a 15-hour flight, this is not a particularly happy welcome uh, to the particular territory. But I would claim, well, and I wish I had said this, I hope international law exists, because otherwise this passport means nothing. It is only because of international law that this document called a passport has this ability to give us entrance into all sorts of countries of which we are not national. Anyway, I won't go into all that, but the classic problem is the whole problem of equality among equal and sovereign states. That is seen as a classic problem of international law. And we can see that subsequent history of international law has attempted to solve this, for example, through creating the United Nations. So here we can see it's something like a system of international governance, but the problem with the United Nations is that there isn't any centralized authority, perhaps the Security Council acting in certain uh, situations, but there isn't a world government to enforce the law. Now, other people, of course, would say, and that is a good thing, but that's another whole set of issues. But the whole idea of, you could say, classic international law is let us build up enough international institutions to enable us to actually establish a system of law that would be enforced, and that would help the whole process of creating world peace and world governance. More law is good. And we can also see another institution. Uh, this is the International Court of Justice at what I call the Hague, but I think it's properly pronounced as, I think you all would have a better sense of how to pronounce it than Ha, the International Court of Justice. And here too, we have a judicial body. So we can see it's something like a domestic legal system in trying to establish a judicial legal system. But the problem is that uh, there are uh, it's uh, sometimes difficult to enforce the judgments of the court, again, in the absence of a sovereign state. So I would claim that all the great international lawyers for the last 200 years have attempted to solve this problem of suggesting or creating plausibly a theory of how international law is law, even though there is no system of enforcement. I won't go through all the names, but I would say that uh, I would uh, be able to describe most of the major figures, such as uh, Hirsch, Lauter, Park, or Thomas Frank, in terms of trying to deal with this issue. 
Now the question is, uh, what historical events generate our theory? Because if that becomes the universal paradigm that we all must try to deal with, could that, rather than being something that enables us to understand the universal character of international law, could that be something which actually has the effect of constraining how we view international law and understand its operations. Now, let us try and take a different incident, a diff different historical event, and see whether we could generate another set of issues, a different set of issues. And the event I've chosen, this is not something that would be easily recognizable, but this is the closest I could get to a particular event that took place off the coast of Singapore in 1603. What happened off the coast of Singapore in 1603 was that there was a Portuguese vessel, a caravel, called the Santa Catarina. It contained massive treasures from its trade in China, something like three million guilders, something like that. It was such a valuable treasure that it was said that the treasure was worth something like half, half the wealth of England in that year, 1603. This was Chinese porcelain and all the other uh, wealth that China produced. And this vessel was attacked by these other vessels, um, which belonged to um, uh, an entity that was to become known as the Dutch East India Company. And so the Dutch, uh, so these vessels, uh, the uh, Dutch vessels, actually were able to defeat the Portuguese secure the treasure, but this caused a huge, you could say, controversy in Europe itself. Because the question was, on what legal grounds could the Dutch attack the Portuguese and seize this treasure? Isn't this the action of pirates? Isn't this the sort of thing exactly that piracy represents? And that was the great controversy that emerged in uh, in Europe in 16, uh, after this event in 1603. Now what we are talking about here is a particular, we're not talking about a state, we're talking about a different type of entity. And this is the entity that was involved. <coughs> and I'm not sure whether here in Cape Town you have anything similar to this coat of arms. Yes. 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 Uh, this is from a fort, uh, which I'm somewhat familiar with, uh, in a city called Gaul in Sri Lanka. It is the Dutch fort built by the Dutch East India Company in Gaul, which is now a UNESCO project. It is a beautifully preserved uh, 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 entity. And so um, it is, we're talking not about a state. Remember, <coughs> Westphalia was about the emergence of a state. But I'm talking about something different because of a different event, and I'm talking about a corporation the Dutch East India Company. And what a company it was. This is the extent of the trading network created by the Dutch East India Company. And we can see, um, I was caught in a snowstorm uh, traveling from uh, Cornell to Toronto in January. That was, I acted on very bad advice.